Hello friends, welcome back to me rambling about imaginary spaces inside a disc that I've inserted into a magical rectangle a bunch of times. This is the second part of a two-part list, so if you missed the first half, check the description for a link to that video. Or if you don't care about chronology, you can just start here. Just know that I will never trust you if that's what you choose to do. That's like starting the series with Dream Drop Distance. To recap 13 through 8 though, we went over 100 Acre Wood, Atlantica, Deep Jungle, Wonderland, Monstro, and Agrabah in that order. Today we'll tackle 7 through 1, and by tackle, I mean gingerly analyze because I bruise easily. Before I get started, I'll say that these first three worlds I'm going to cover here swapped placements a good few times. Uh, at some points, number seven was number five, and vice versa, and every other combination in between. And that is to say, I can be convinced especially easily that my opinions on these first couple are verifiably wrong. All right, without further ado, here is number seven. I really struggled with where to put Olympus Colosseum because I think the least generous but still fair description is three square rooms and one is for bosses and wave after wave of mob fights, and yet packed into those three rooms and bosses and mob fights is a ton of charm and personality. Of course, what the world lacks in physical space, it more than makes up for in content. Olympus is a unique world and that the time you spend there on your first visit is likely shorter than even the tutorial world, but it serves as a great way to illustrate Sora's power creep throughout the game. Obviously, the game itself is doing that on its own, on a macro scale, going from seashore spars with schoolchildren to casting tier 3 magic spells on a fleshy abomination in a black void of space, but there's something about returning to an early game location and climbing your way through the ranks. Like how you can return to a Wonderland or Agrabah once you get high jump or glide, you return to an Olympus Colosseum kind of world when your character is physically stronger and more defensively capable. While that power creep is conveyed through the actual gameplay, it also happens through story, and Olympus Colosseum is a big part of that transformation. When you first show up, Sora can't even earn the respect of literal goat man shit stack Phil, and bear in mind you can show up here immediately after Traverse Town or after defeating Chernabog if you want, and Phil is unimpressed regardless. Regardless, I fought a bunch of monsters is a bit too vague of a defense, apparently. Regardless, Sora isn't even clearing Junior Hero yet at this point in his journey. This little plotline kind of gets wrapped up twice, once in this game and once in Cage 2. Phil never actually confers the title of Hero onto Sora in this game. Instead, after beating the first three cups, Sora gives what's basically a great value brand version of his My Friends or My Power speech, which Phil is baffled by. Hercules, however, backs up Sora's claim that strength comes from friendship, and I've always appreciated this cutscene both on its own and in comparison to its Cage 2 equivalent. In the sequel, Phil also never really promotes the group to hero status, rather it's implied that the gods themselves have decided for him by putting on their art show in the cosmos. Both scenes are good and charming enough, but I prefer the idea of Sora coming to not really care if he meets someone else's criteria for hero. A huge part of KH1's messaging is that Sora isn't actually extraordinary or destined for anything, not even the Keyblade. He's what some might call a dull, ordinary boy whose biggest strength is his connections to others. Maybe I'm just reaching for a reason to prop up KH1 over KH2 again here, but I like the message in KH1 a lot more. I get that Sora has a competitive nature, it's part of his personality, but I feel like he leaves Olympus Colosseum in KH1 on a more mature note than he does a year later in KH2. I like how the main protagonist of the movie the world is based on doesn't show up until the very end of your first visit. It's unique to this world, and as a kid, you're like, come on, where's the guy they named the movie after? So it's a really fun moment when he shows up to save the day. You know, when Cerberus has his giant paw firmly pressed into the body of now humiliated video game icon Cloud fucking Strife. I've stated before that I was not cognizant of the Final Fantasy Fantasy universe prior to playing KH1, I'm sure a very small percentage of five-year-olds were, but looking back on this really is something. Like, you know, I'm a big Smash Bros guy, it's up there with Kingdom Hearts as one of my favorite series. Remember when Cloud was announced for Smash 4? We all acted like it was the impossible made possible. But seriously, let's take a young Xehanort bullshit time travel trip back to, I don't know, May of 2001. KH1's been in development for about 15 months, Melee is just about to be shown off at E3 with a release date at the end of the year. What is Cloud Strife going to do first? Battle it out with iconic video game colleagues like Mario, Link, and Samus, or... I don't know, share some screen time with Donald Duck and the three-headed dog from Hercules. Like, who in the hell is betting on door number two here? I'm glad he went on to do both, but like, wow, we truly forget very quickly how ridiculous the whole thing is. And yet, it works. I love how they use Cloud here, and I wish it was something they did in, like, literally any other world throughout the series. KH1 starts a tradition of plopping one Final Fantasy character into Olympus, though I'm not sure why we couldn't have had a few other worlds, both in KH1 and other games, with some one-off appearances from other Final Fantasy characters. When I was a kid, I didn't know about Cloud, 
Stroud or Leon or Yuffie, but I still thought they were cool, their presence didn't bother me. Looking back now with more knowledge and appreciation for their games and characters, I think it was a huge missed opportunity. The context of the games, and especially KH1, is set up so well to lend to a recurrence of displaced Final Fantasy characters. Maybe they're all from Radiant Garden, maybe they're not, but the destruction and chaos taking place allows there to be some flexibility in who's showing up where. Maybe the Kingdom Hearts iteration of Jet ended up as part of Captain Hook's crew, or maybe Lulu's been working with Dr. Finkelstein in his lab or in Cage 2 run into Red 13 in the Pride Lands. These are just some bad fanficy examples and it wouldn't or shouldn't be in every world, but some Final Fantasy presence in the Disney worlds more than just one time could have given us a lot more fun scenarios like Cloud being manipulated by Hades. KH3, of course, laps in the face of this complaint, and that's a critique of KH3 that I actually tend to agree with. Though, it doesn't sink my enjoyment of the game, let me just say that. Anyway, yes, I think the Colosseum has a lot to enjoy on a thematic and experiential level. To circle back to Cerberus again, that was the first boss that felt truly intimidating, especially if you're going in the intended world order. Like, Darkseid was big and all, but he mostly just meanders about and stands there until you kill him. Cerberus is stomping around, spitting fireballs, spawning evil pools of darkness, and gnashing his teeth. You're a Assuredly the underdog in this fight, fittingly in a battle against a dog from the underworld. And let's not forget the collection of boss fights you can access on your return trips. Leon and Yuffie, Leon and Cloud, Hades, Ice Titan, goddamn Sephiroth. You might have noticed I omitted Hercules and the Rock Titan because I have no idea what the hell they were doing for both of those fights. But those other ones though, and not just the dedicated boss fights, how about when the tournaments just throw you some battles that include enemies that previously served as bosses? Like yeah, here's guard armor again, how about opposite armor? Remember Stealth Sneak? Yeah, try two of them. And they don't even get their own spooky music, they're just part of the grind now, another great way to illustrate that power creep. Also, before we leave, let me just do a little bit more bitching. You know when you progress through both KH1 and 2, the game lets you know when new cups are available? Which of these scenarios is more charming and thoughtful to you? Chip and Dale hopping on the radio to tell you they have word of a new tournament, or a new episode is available? Just saying. I think out of all 13 worlds in the game, the absolute hardest one for me to place was Destiny Islands. Its status as a tutorial world makes it something of a natural outlier, and so I could see someone thinking I have it far too high for something you spend so little time on. On the other hand, I feel like there may be a bit of a perception out there that it's blasphemous to have worlds original to Kingdom Hearts outside of the very top spots, so I'd also understand if people were annoyed by how low I have it. I compromise so that neither side is happy and put it somewhere in the middle. Sort of like how I handled Olympus Coliseum, I'm approaching Destiny Islands from the angle of viewing the world as an experience rather than strictly as a level, if that makes sense. I think the key word here with regards to Destiny Islands is anticipation. It is quite literally the calm before the storm. Even 17 years later, there's an excitement in the air as Sora, Riku, and Kairi make preparations for their journey to parts unknown. And as a kid, I thought their plan was going to work. I mean, I didn't know the laws of world boundaries yet. I thought maybe, yeah, they get on the raft with their mushrooms and coconuts and their big-ass egg and sail out far enough and fall off the edge of the map a la KH3 Caribbean. And so when the storm starts up and there's a terrifying ball of dark apocalypse energy hanging in the sky, so hangs this feeling of dread and, again, anticipation. At least that's the impression it made on me as a kid, but to be honest, it's still there even now. It's such a quick transition from gathering supplies on the beach for this naive adventure to literally the end of the world. It was the first sort of thing like that that I had ever experienced in media. It always felt so impactful how you start at this place and you can't ever go back, and it's something that's really never repeated again in the series, at least not to this degree. And I really think we forget and undersell how heavy this is relative to like 80% of the series, this sunny, carefree world is sucked into oblivion, and we know Sora and Riku have parents and three other friends who don't make it off the island. I mean, that gave me the creeps as a kid. What a harrowing thing to happen to a bunch of children. In my opinion, a huge part of the magic in this world can be credited to the buildup of two plot lines set on a collision course with each other, conveyed by this interlacing sequence of cutscenes spread out over the two days and one night spent on the island. More than any other world on this list, I really had to think back to how I experienced this as a kid, because the factor of first impressions weighs the heaviest in Destiny Islands, more so than any other locale. And so when I put myself back in those small, likely Velcro and or light up shoes, I remember when a Destiny Island scene melted into one of Donald at Disney Castle that I was jazzed as fuck. That's not revisionist history either. I turned to my mom and said, yo, ma, I am jazzed as fuck that this is happening right now. And she said, you're grounded. I mean, believe it or not, that's what a huge chunk of us bought the game for back in the day, the Disney of it all. I was interested in the aspirations of the island crew, but bear in mind, I was a five-year-old, so I got Donald Duck and Goofy on my screen now. All of that spiky-haired intrigue went right to the back of my mind. But I knew from both commercials and from looking at the back of the case that these three were going to end up traveling together somehow, and so I was just fascinated with how that was going to happen. We jump back and forth between these two worlds, who knows how far apart they are, but we gradually come to understand that these two stories are set to converge in a big way. On 
top of that, for me, I was really invested in finding out where the hell Mickey the goddamn mouse was in a game that so prominently featured Disney characters. What do you mean he's not at the castle with the rest of them? He packed up in the middle of the night and left them a letter? I mean, finding out where he was, that was priority number one for my younger self. Older gamers who picked up a copy of Kingdom Hearts probably just wanted to see where this crazy premise could possibly go, but there was also a carrot on the stick for kids like me, someone who could probably put KH1 as one of the first 10 or 15 games I ever played. Like, I am literally going to go to the ends of the earth to get this mouse's autograph. I will kill anyone who gets in my way. This might be surprising to hear considering how many fans seem to dislike a lengthy introduction, but I think Destiny Islands could have been served by being just a bit longer, if only to give us more time with specifically Kyrie, as we don't get too many opportunities to know more about her character throughout the first game. Though I think that criticism of Kyrie can pretty much extend throughout the entire series, but I digress. Make it a three-day thing, like Kingdom Hearts loves its threes, maybe let's just spend a day, I don't know, saying goodbye to our loved ones, eating the dinners that our mothers prepared for us, ungrateful little shits. Regarding the physical world itself, I think Destiny Island serves as the second half of a two-part crash course on the mechanics of Kingdom Hearts. The Dive to the Heart is a flat, spacious area meant to teach you the basic conventions of combat and how to navigate the menus. Destiny Islands is here to ease you into the platforming and exploration aspects of the game, you know, everyone's favorite part of Kingdom Hearts 1. I mean, that statement isn't really at all sarcastic for me, but... Okay, sorry, stopping down to bitch again. People act like this game controls like shit when it comes to navigating, like it's pulling teeth whenever they have to jump from one platform to another, and... I don't know, is it actually bad and I'm just numb to it? I know platforming obviously isn't the focus of the game, but it never kills me when I have to do it. Is it the shining highlight of the game? No, but I think people are a bit hyperbolic when they call it atrocious or painful. Maybe it's just because I've played it so much for so long at this point, but I think the clunkiness is over-exaggerated. I'm just saying, the majority of the games I played growing up were platformers, many around the time when I first played Kingdom Hearts, and I never found the platforming so troublesome that it lowered my enjoyment of the game. Anyway, if it weren't for Cage 2's, in my opinion, masterfully done prologue, Destiny Islands would have my vote for my favorite prologue in the series. Just so charming between the banter and the Final Fantasy kids and the secret place, but... Oh, you know what's not charming at all? That scene with Ansem in the secret place. I did not like that as a kid. Even after the first time, and especially when playing alone, I'd run in for that mushroom like when you turn off the lights and run up the stairs into your bedroom. What a creepy bastard. As a kid, I was not strong enough to stare into that spooky hood hole by myself. Can become stronger. Oh god, no thank you. I mentioned I had a lot of trouble placing these first three, and at the center of that difficulty is Neverland. On some days, I think I could have it as high as number three, simply for how well it serves as a vehicle, quite literally, from the second to third act of the game. Essentially, Neverland is like the opening act for Hall of Ashen, a hype man of sorts. I mentioned in part one how there was another world besides Monstro that was sort of like a Kingdom Hearts world with a Disney coat of paint, and Neverland is what I was referring to. I do think this world definitely leans on the Disney stuff much more, but it's similar to Monstro in that a portion of the world is framed around the conflict between Sora and Riku, and tension have risen even higher than our last run-in. In fact, let's just track Riku's progression throughout the game up to this point real quick. Destiny Islands, he's kind of a dick, tries to steal your girl, throws logs at you. Not great, but a passing grade. I mean, we've all been there. Agrabah, he kidnaps a lady. Monstro, he kidnaps a boy. Well, not a real boy. But a Neverland? Yeah, Sora, may I interest you in some murder? Open wide, here comes the big die, courtesy of this actual demon spawn I learned how to make in home ec. This had me shook as a kid. Not to mention, this is also the first time since the island that Sora is in the same world as Kairi, or same ship as her. Yeah, let me just get the negatives out of the way before getting back to the good stuff. The world is called Neverland, and yet you never land in Neverland. It's the most inaccurate world name in the series. I won't lie and pretend that it wasn't disappointing that for all but one room in the world, you're confined to Captain Hook's pirate ship. Thematically, I love the idea of a world that simultaneously serves as transport to another, but practically, it gets a bit boring walking around the interior of a pirate ship. So not unlike Monstro, I dock the world some points for its design, but I give it ample credit for what it does story-wise, plus I'm much fonder of the characters used here. And speaking of, Peter Pan is such a douche. Like, he's our douche, but god, is there ever a party member in the rest of the series who is so consistently a brat to Sora? I get that this whole thing is that he never grows up, but grow the fuck up, Pete. But it's something different and honestly amusing, so I appreciate it here. I'm the answer to your prayers. <laughs> uh, Captain Hook is the best villain in the game. He's so fed up with everything, so flamboyant, over the top, doing impressions of Heartless. He's great. How about him just casually dropping an HB on you towards the end of the world? Run off where? Tell me, where did he go? To the ruins of Hollow Bastion where Maleficent resides. 
Like, what the hell? You're allowed to say that? You know you're a Disney character and you're talking about a KH original world, right? Like, is that in your contract? KH2 could never. You think Sean Yu gives a damn about a world that never was? You think Barbosa is just letting those radiant gardens fly? Nah. Captain Hook's in the inner circle. He's, like, number three in the hierarchy for sure, so he has those privileges. But really, though, like, the end of the world is the end, and Hollow Bastion is, like, the beginning of the end, but Neverland in this spot is, like, the beginning of the beginning of the end. Like, what on Walter Elias Disney's green mouse ear-wearing earth is a Hollow Bastion? The plot is now thick, with three C's and a Q. And I'm throwing in a 7 for a limited time. And dudes, the flying... Alright, if you look at the back of the box, you actually know this is coming. Even so, if you somehow didn't, you've got to figure that they're going to let you fly around at some point in this world. So if you want to take the conversation back to anticipation, here you go. On the grander scale, this world is building up to Hollow Bastion, but independently, it's all about the build-up to that moment when you finally take flight. And the scene where that happens is so cheesy and classically Disney, but it's great. And getting to fly around freely in a space that kept you confined to the ground for the first three quarters of your visit, incredibly cathartic. And after my cousins and I endured a grueling session of fights against Captain Hook after we sealed the keyhole, seeing learned shared ability glide pop up on screen, that's a milestone in life right there. I know it's just gliding, like not full on flight in Neverland, but being able to carry that ability outside of the world was nuts to me. I mean, let's not get bogged down in semantics here. Flying in any capacity is and always will be the shit. Why is it that our gut reaction to the question about what superpower we'd want to have is always flight, even when there's like 20 much more practical superpowers? Why is the Tanuki Leaf the objectively best Mario power-up? It's because flying is the shit. If the SRK drama and the looming hollow bastion of it all wasn't enough of a hint, we're entering the end game because Sora is airborne, people. And before we fly on off, to the next world on the list, I just have to talk about the Clock Tower. What a great area. And try not to think too hard about whether you're in London and if that is somehow a separate or shared world space with Neverland itself. As a kid, I would just come back to this area and fly around just because I could, and then the Phantom takes up residence there, which I hated. Like, dude, you, that was my spot. You're, you're in my spot right now. And speaking of, what a great concept for a boss fight. It's one of the few fights that really works in tandem with the environment that it's set in. I wish there was a bit more done with it to spice it up and make it more involved after you figure out the basic strategy of it, but I've got to give it points for creating creativity, and for giving Peter Pan the opportunity to non-canonically join the club of characters who get murder-murdered. Remember how I said in the first video that Wonderland was kind of an oddball choice for a world? I might have to take that back because on reflection, that movie is at least part of the traditional animated Disney canon. Perhaps a bigger surprise, and a much more pleasant one if you ask me, is the representation of The Nightmare Before Christmas via Halloween Town. This pick would be like pulling from James and the Giant Peach or something like Frankenweenie for a more modern example. Like who really would have had this movie on their radar if they went into the game blind? Just as it was sort of an unorthodox pick for a world, maybe Halloween Town at number 4 on the list is a bit unexpected. You know, we've talked about story and themes and stuff like that for a lot of this list, but at the end of the day, if I'm gonna pick the Disney World that's the most fun to play and look at and be engrossed in, it's Halloween Town for me. I honestly can't remember if I had seen the movie prior to playing the game, but regardless, I was enamored with the environment and especially the redesigns for our party members. Alongside Atlantica, this is one of two worlds in KH1 that changes your appearance, and while Atlantica has you changing a bit more dramatically, I'm a much bigger fan of the new duds in Halloween Town. Donald as a mummy, Goofy as a sort of Frankenstein monster, and Sora as someone who's really excited about the My Chemical Romance reunion. Of all the Disney worlds besides the aforementioned two that the party visits, the only ones where they don't look a bit out of place are like Wonderland, maybe Monstro, but I think the developers knew that the brightly colored Sora, Donald, and Goofy would look especially jarring when up against the dark and moody backgrounds of Halloween Town. Makes you wonder why it took them a minute to figure out that these guys weren't exactly inconspicuous when roaming around the Caribbean. And they could have just thrown a darker hue on the character models, kind of like what they do with Riku and Mickey in Chain of Memories, but they took the opportunity to go the extra mile and be a little creative. As far as the story elements go, I won't try and pretend that this world doesn't deserve to get yada yada whenever someone's giving a summary of the first game. And honestly, when you compare Halloween Town to the other Disney worlds, it's in contention for the least significant on a story level. No Princess of Heart here like Wonderland or Agrabah, no Riku or Kairi involvement like Monstro and Neverland. Worlds like Deep Jungle, Olympus Coliseum, and Atlantica gave us some character building moments with the trio or a bit of ambiguous lore. Even the Disney villain in this world, while only second to Captain Hook in terms of fun, isn't one of the more involved members of the council. Maybe that's in my head, but I always felt like Ursula and Oogie were like the more detached and insignificant members, followed by Hades, then Hook, then Jafar, and then Maleficent. So yes, in my head canon in the Disney Organization 6, Ursula and Oogie are number 6 and 5. And you know how they all have nicknames in the real organization, like Axel is the Flurry of Dancing Flames and Vexen is the Chili Academic. Ursula is the Asthmatic Sea Cow and Oogie is the Infuriated Shit Sack. Nobody disrespects me! Nobody!
but yeah, no important chess pieces being moved, no lore from the past. I concede the world is weak on that front. However, I think there's actually a bit of lore being made while we're here, and it's something I've really come to enjoy. The plot of this world centers around the creation of this artificial heart and what it means to have a heart, which in the Kingdom Hearts context really means a soul. I mean, in the game itself, I think a soul is a bit different than how we might consider it. It's more so something that powers the body, like the indicator for something being living or deceased. But the way Kingdom Hearts talks about hearts, it's much more in line with how we view souls or spirits. This little plot thread is kind of like the one that gets teased out in Atlantica about key bearers of the past, and that it's not really something that gets explored a whole lot in KH1. By my estimation, the closest thing would be the sort of musing that Riku does in passing about how Pinocchio, a wooden puppet, has a heart. And like that King Triton scene, this talk of artificial hearts versus real ones becomes, in my opinion, Opinion more and more interesting the further we get away from it. Since that moment, the series has experimented and toyed with this concept, literally whether it's the experiment in KH2 or the toy box toys in KH3. Artificial intelligence, a snowman, the undead, or data. More and more I become convinced that the series, even post KH3, is really building up to this core concept of what it means and takes to qualify for a heart to qualify for a soul. Is it an independent process, or does it rely on the belief of others? If the real world operated under Kingdom Hearts rules, I don't think my microphone here would have a heart, but if I or enough others earnestly believe that it did, would that make it so? And what would that mean? Would it tell me my breath smells? Is the entity of Kingdom Hearts itself responsible for assigning hearts, i.e. soulfulness, to anything or anyone that may seek it? The earliest roots of this line of questioning can be traced back to this scene in Dr. Finkelstein's lab. The doctor says the heart is not all that complicated, but the game doesn't support that. That. The ingredients they list off at first are pulse, emotion, terror, fear, hope, and despair. That doesn't work, and they later try adding memory and surprise. Before we can see the effects of round two in the lab, the heart is stolen by the neighborhood crack fiends and later consumed by Oogie Boogie. So what's going on here? Oogie absorbs the heart, calls on the heartless, and only two show up. Is this just a gag, or is attendance tied to the quality of the product in this scenario? Is the game suggesting that a properly made heart, an organic one, would have granted Oogie more power? As I said, we've seen artificially created beings have hearts, beings that are literally lines of code, so why is this heart not doing the trick? Is it because the intent behind its creation was scientific and calculated, because you can't break a heart into literal ingredients and hope to replicate one that way? It's interesting stuff, and as I said, it becomes more interesting as we move forward in the series. Regarding the world itself, I think Halloween Town is like the perfect size for a Disney World. It kind of leans on the linear side more than what you might have come to expect from KH1. You basically slowly chip away at making progress toward the manor, but the areas are spacious and open enough that it's not a glorified, decorated hallway like it is in KH2. Progression is a bit backtracky here, but it's nowhere near as egregious as it is in Deep Jungle. Obviously, all of the worlds in the game have a unique look and feel to them, but Halloween Town especially stands out for its gritty, foggy atmosphere. I love how even the Heartless have a little bit of a dirty filter applied to their textures. I've talked about set pieces a few times in this list, recognizable spots the designers can take from the movies, and one of the best is the Moonlight Hill in my opinion. It's not super involved or anything, but it's a great and iconic pull from the source material, and it was basically a requirement to have somewhere in the level. And lastly, I talked about it in KH1 vs 2, but man, I, I love Oogie's Manor. I won't repeat all the talking points again, but I just wanted to reiterate that. Oh, okay, actual last thing, uh, Jack Skellington is one of my favorite party members. He's having so much fun, he is thrilled to be doing some good old-fashioned cartoon violence. Here I come! Come on, fellas, let's go! Over the years, the KH1 world that's had the biggest rise in my rankings is End of the World. That's not to say I used to dislike it, really, I've just come to appreciate a lot about it. First of all, I think you can call its mere existence a surprise, and I'm saying that more so from a meta perspective than an in-game one. Hollow Bastion, for all intents and purposes, could have easily served as the final world. It had all the markings of a final gauntlet. Big, intimidating castle setting, the toughest-looking Heartless we'd seen so far, and a bunch of bosses, including the one we've been led to believe was our primary antagonist for the game. But then Ansem steps out, pulls back the curtain, and behind the curtain is this abstract hellscape. A twisted amalgamation of world corpses, like some sort of galactic Pangea that's been breaking apart and reforming and changing its existence hour by hour, minute by minute. A location that is also an event. The end of the world. I mean seriously, look at this thing. Is it even possible for this image to not strike any considerable degree of apprehension or intrigue within you? What the fuck are we looking at, guys? Cage one isn't gonna sit us down and explain it to us, I'll tell you that much. It's a place happening somewhere, that's for sure. It's certainly not a city or a castle. It's flesh? Distortion? Like, magic syrup and firework dust? Is it a planet? Is it a wormhole? How about you go fuck yourself, says Kingdom Hearts. Remember defenders, wizards, dark balls, wyverns, really burly looking heartless befitting of the last dungeon? Nope! Weak sauce. Angel stars. Oh god, is it's, it's like a container with these fleshy, spiny wings attached? Is there fluid in that thing? Are, are those three dots? It's eyes? Oh god, don't touch me, don't touch me. Oh, how about invisibles? Basically, we took a dark side, dehydrated 
created it, chopped it into pieces, and all of the pieces did P90X. And they have a sword, and you're gonna call them Daddy. Remember when you fought that behemoth at the end of Hollow Bastion? Yeah, they're not really a big deal around these parts. Here's a couple of them, thanks. End of the World is like if the entirety of Hollow Bastion fell asleep and had a really bad acid trip nightmare, and then it became tangible. It's like post-game before the game is actually finished. It's the embodiment of all of the weird shit that KH1 does that I love so, so much. End of the World is potentially the most linear world in the game, but I'm fine with that here, as I am with it in the world that never was, because it's a chase. We're delving into the final boss's headquarters until he's cornered and has to face us. <sighs> Conceptually, this world is so, so great. We've been told the whole game that even worlds have hearts, and we know what happens to things that lose their hearts, and so here we are, inside a world that's effectively a heartless itself, made up of the remnants of all the worlds that have fallen to darkness. This is the visual result of that dire atmosphere that the game has been mired in since the very beginning. We're getting to see just what happens to a place like Destiny Islands when it's consumed by the heartless. I'm surprised Waka's disembodied head isn't just floating on by in the final dimension. Hey, what's happening, man? But really, all those places where your summons are from, where the Dalmatians used to live, where the princesses used to be, it's all right here. Everything has coalesced into this swirling mass of Armageddon. Also, Disney Satan lives here now, in case you were slow on the uptake. Much like the world itself, my next few points aren't going to have too much structure, I'm just kinda gonna throw them at you. Uh, world Terminus is crazy. As a kid, I always took it to be, like, how the Heartless physically accessed a world. Like, whenever you're in Agrabah or whatever, and a Heartless spawns, it's because all the way over here in World Terminus, a bandit was like, alright, see ya, Jerry, I'm heading over to the big glowy pillar for my shift at the desert. I get that that's probably not what's happening here, but even so, that just means that it's actually something else that's probably weirder and even more abstract. Regardless, it's so eerie going back to these slightly altered and closed-off versions of previous worlds. Uh, the giant crevasse? What is this? Gummy ship hell? There's no other area in the game like it. Wait, back to World Terminus. That hollow bastion room at the end of the line, it's a room that you haven't even seen before. Dude, the machine in the middle. It drops some knowledge on you, but more importantly, a Kingdom Hearts. Like, the game says its name and it took us until this far in. Like, what? That's an actual thing? I thought it was just two words mushed together to sound cool. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'm pointing out the obvious here, but the music here being arrangements of the Dive to the Heart music from the prologue is some great bookending. Like, what a nice way to make everything feel full circle. And speaking of bookending in full circles, depressed in the islands, like when you walk through the door and you're greeted with this, and then it turns into this, I don't even have anything to say, just look at this, look at it. Look how they massacred my boy. And while we're here, this final boss rush is nuts. I want to talk to the people responsible for the world of chaos and ask them if they're okay. Is there symbolism here? Some sort of mythological or religious inspiration? Or is this all sick, twisted originality? End of the world and the world that never was are so fun to look at as a yin and yang because they're really such polar opposites to each other and I love both of them for it. End of the world is pretty light on plot and cutscenes. And right down to the world design even, nothing is really explained all too much. World that never was is chock full of cutscenes and tons of explanations and revelations. End of the world is natural, organic. World that never was is artificial and constructed. Again, both great for their own reasons. And even down to the bosses themselves, we've got Xemnas strapping into his big armor throne, riding around on his robot dragon nobody ship. Ansem, on the other hand, fuses into his guardian and a mound of, I don't know, flesh leftovers from yesterday's dinner and I would assume a lot of asbestos. Xemnas is like, alright, final battle, time to break out the Moo Moo coat, gotta put on my Sunday best. Ansem says, excuse me, do you have a moment to talk about my exposed nipples? Like, what the hell is going on here, sir? I can see your nipples, and we're not in Atlantica, so you better have a good reason for it. Literally, why are you doing this? What about this process meant you had to take your shirt off, you goddamn weirdo? I figure it would be almost cheating in favor of the world to talk about everything that's going on after dealing the final blow, so I'll just say this. When Kyrie's on that platform and holding Sora's hand, that when from Simple and Clean as their hands break apart, that hits like a Mack truck. That's the sound that launched a thousand sequels. I won't play it here because apparently having Simple and Clean in a YouTube video might as well be me playing the entire Beatles catalog over footage from James Cameron's Avatar, but I'm sure you can still hear it clear as day. I know I do. Ah, Traverse Town. I bet you never thought about it, but it has a population of upwards 120, at least if you count dogs in the census. And it makes sense, because I'd say Traverse Town is easily the chalk pick for where you'd want to live in the Kingdom Hearts universe, only rivaled by another town of the same initials. Whenever I hear about the Kingdom Hearts origin story, that legend of the Disney and Square executives meeting in the elevator, I always think of Traverse Town as the visual embodiment of that dream fully realized. This is the physical location of the crossroads where all of the magic meets, where our original character and Sora crosses over with Final Fantasy and 
and Disney, a combination about as natural as mayonnaise and breakfast cereal. And yet, the world serves as a litmus test for the series, and 17 years, like a dozen games, and just a couple million dollars later, I think that test was sufficiently passed. This world and the next are extremely intimidating to even try and unpack, because I think they both do so much for the game and the series. Well, let me try and take it piece by piece. I've brought it up before, but for me, there's something so romantic about the idea of this world that just formed out of necessity as a safe haven for people who have lost their original homes. Uh, romantic as in the idealistic kind, not the pow poo kind. Although, but yeah, it's kind of the friendlier sibling of the end of the world, whereas that place is just all of the worlds torn asunder. This one reforms and reshapes to fit the needs of its citizens. So I'm already in love with the premise, and if it too disappears like end of the world does once everything is restored to normal, well, that kind of makes me sad because this is one of the most beautiful and memorable worlds in the entire series. There's so much to say about the atmosphere and appearance and music of Traverse Town, and it's all stuff that has assuredly been said time and time again. The Victorian houses, the perpetual nighttime, the dreamy background music, that is all in the Bible of mandatory Traverse Town praise. I won't waste any more time on the obvious because if I did, we'd be here all night and all night and all night after that. What I will add here is why I think this place comes to feel like home beyond the factor of its inviting appearance. For my money, this is the only true hub world in the Kingdom Hearts series. Alright, maybe that's a bit dramatic, but I think it's the best one, and for me, it's not really close. I'm a sucker for a good hub world, though, or even just centralized bases of operations. KH2 has Radiant Garden, and KH3 has one-eighth of Twilight Town, but neither hold a candle to KH1 Traverse Town for me. The other two are still great in their own ways, but at different things. There's just so much available in Traverse Town, so many reasons to circle back, and not just for the handful of times where it's required to progress the plot. There's so many opportunities to get new stuff, and I like getting new stuff. New Trinity of all types, new chests to reach, summons to revive, rewards to get for accomplishing side quests, this is the nexus for all of that. Not to mention, the first district basically doubles as a shopping mall, it's the only place in the game where you can exchange your money as well as synthesize items. KH2 and beyond definitely save the player a lot of time by having moogles around every corner, but I don't know, it feels like less of an adventure when you don't have to set course for home base to restock on items and get prepared for your next outing. Totally a preferential thing, it's way less practical, but these are my preferences after all. On top of that, you gotta cross through Traverse Town to get to Hundred Acre Wood, you've also got Merlin here if you want to practice any new magic by beating up his furniture. It's a feature that I'm sure a majority of players didn't use more than once, but as a kid I'd spend a lot of time here, mostly when I had access to the game but didn't want to move the plot forward or mess anything up because my cousins weren't around and I wasn't about to risk skipping ahead without them. So I'll just abuse this sofa until I'm allowed to fly to the next world. As a full package, it's just such a great jumping off point before each adventure, and always so welcoming to return to after sealing a keyhole in another world. Another massive strength for the world is in its layout. As a hub world, it shouldn't be linear in any way, if you ask me at least, and it isn't. Coincidentally, my point on Traverse Town's world design can also be concisely explained by Billy Zane. This world has been connected. For me, I think part of why Traverse Town feels so homey and comfortable is because it's the most like an actual small town or village. You don't always get from A to Z the same way. You can pass through B, or you can take a shortcut through Q, a lot like a real living space for a community. So many rooms in this world have various points of entry, and I think the interconnectedness helps the world feel so much more believable and lived in, even when the NPCs typically barricade themselves up in the various safe areas throughout the world. For the record, if my counting is right, there are 21 separate rooms in Traverse Town, making it the world with the most areas, and each one is so jam-packed with personality, and more often than not, you have a few options for how you can enter that area. Uh, take the second district, for example. You can exit or enter it from the first district, the alleyway, the Dalmatian's house, two points from the hotel, two points from the gizmo shop, and two points from the third district. That's nine different points of entry for one room. I figured that's gotta be the best example, but this design philosophy is present throughout the entire world, and to a degree, the whole game. Once again, some people might prefer a more linear layout, but I love open and interconnected spaces and video game levels. And in real life, like, my house isn't like this, but houses where you can get to the living room via two different rooms? Those are the best houses. Is it just me? I like having options. I talked about this with Cloud and Olympus earlier, but the madness of Sora, Donald Duck, Goofy, Aerith, Squall, and Yuffie in a huddle of post guard armor is not lost on me. The foul-mouthed pilot from Final Fantasy VII is next-door neighbors with the kids from DuckTales. Completely bonkers stuff going on here that I think I have gradually become unfazed by. Altogether, we've got seven different properties intermingling in this world, uh, eight if you want to count FF7 and eight as their own things, and it all blends together so well, Merlin and Sid lending a book back and forth, Leon helping Geppetto and Pinocchio find a place to live, none of these interactions draw attention to themselves, they just work, and none of it really feels out of place until you purposefully think long and hard about it. I could probably talk about Traverse Town for half an hour on its own, and I'm trying to keep each of these entries relatively close in length, so I'll wrap it up here. I'll say this though, I think Traverse Town is the premier example of how the crossover elements of Kingdom Hearts should work, and I think it's a model that ought to be followed more often at later points in the series.
number one, it's Hollow Bastion. Okay, but really, what, what can I say? I really don't know if words can do it justice. The, the world is so powerful that so much discussion of other worlds on the list was reliant on me talking about Hollow Bastion. I tried to write around it, but it's just too impactful and central to the discussion to ignore. Hollow Bastion is not the last world in the game, but it is what the game is building up to. Despite being the penultimate world, it's the location where the bulk of the most important stuff goes down. Like, think about how the Cage 2 intro does a sort of soft recap on the first game, everything culminates in Hollow Bastion, not the end of the world. It's because so so much happens here. The true villain is revealed, Riku loses his autonomy, the secret of Kairi's status is explained, and Sora makes a decision that's going to lay the foundation for the rest of the series. A decision that should make the events of KH3 a bit easier to understand. Okay, I think the easiest way for me to talk about this world might just be to go through it step by step, otherwise I'm just gonna speak in sweeping generalities about how amazing everything is. So back in the Monstro part, I talked about how the mouth was a great starting room for setting the mood, but the granddaddy in that discussion is the rising falls in Hollow Bastion. I swear, when that world title drops in for the first time and we get that zoom out of the area, the TV shoots out a gust of cold, salty air. Like, this area is thick with atmosphere. We get a huge scene here where we learn that Sora was never the intended recipient for the Keyblade, which had my jaw on the floor as a kid. The game takes everything away from you, your party members, your Keyblade, and even your means of escaping. You're stranded here now, like, is there even anything to eat around here? I love how this moment brings Sora to the lowest point he's been in the game, both story-wise and gameplay-wise. At least after Death of the Islands, he had a reliable way to defend himself. Riku Throwing him the wooden sword that we know damn well isn't even capable of bruising a low-level Shadow Heartless is just absolutely brutal. Sora is left in shambles, but the game gives him a fighting chance in the form of the frickin' Beast of Beauty and the Fame. After a bit of consideration, I think Beast is my favorite party member in the game. He's the physically biggest one in the series up until Marshmallow, and he and Sora could not look more unlike, but their goals and what led them to this world are all too similar. Neither of them are natives to Hollow Bastion, but both have lost their worlds to the Heartless, and both are here on a mission to find the people they care about. And Riku just completely dunked on the both of them, so they're pretty much the most natural allies you could possibly pair together. Hiding behind Beast as he takes out Heartless for you is such an unexpected but really fun shakeup to the gameplay, and it sticks around for just the right amount of time. A lesser game would make you powerless for half or the entire level, and it would get terribly frustrating having to rely on an NPC to do your fighting for you. KH1 only makes it mandatory like two or three times, and it's smart enough to not overstay its welcome. And then, the big speech. I don't care if it's cheesy or sappy, it's a great moment, and there's truth to it. There is truth in life to my friends or my power. In the real world, perhaps the more cynical and opportunistic phrase would be, it's all about who you know, but it couldn't be truer for Sora. My friend Interlight Productions regards this scene as the best in not just the game, but the entire series, and it's hard to argue if only because of how emblematic it is. It's the corest of the core messages that Kingdom Hearts is wont to deliver. Now after the gang is back together, it's all about the climb up the castle. This is the only world in the game where progress is primarily made by moving vertically from bottom to top, and it's a really fun mix-up. Like End of the World, once you get Donald and Goofy feedback, you move from lower to higher fairly linearly, but you have to stop down in certain locations to do a bit of puzzle solving, which is handled in this world better than anywhere else in really the series. Nowadays it's nothing that requires too much thought and it's practically muscle memory, but back on those first few playthroughs it was just challenging enough and required just the right amount of thought to get through. My favorite room in the game is the library. Aside from how cool and cozy it looks, and also that moment when you realize this is where the Kyrie's grandma flashback happened, I love the book puzzles so much. It's not frustrating, and it takes just the right amount of time, long enough that it's satisfying to complete, but short enough that it's not a huge time waster. Also, secret bookshelf passage stuff is like, the best. I love that shit. I'm also a big fan of the emblem door puzzles that follow shortly after, like, I guess we have to appease these statues by showing them the different skills we've learned throughout our journey until they spit out the pieces of the door that we need. From here on, we're just moving our way upwards, taking lifts, moving giant blocks, and riding on big elevators across the length of the castle. I love how the progression weaves through both indoor and outdoor areas, like we're cutting through the castle inside and out, mowing down Heartless as we make our way to the top. When we arrive at Castle Chapel, the initial Maleficent showdown is admittedly a bit underwhelming. I wish we had a bit more taunting or back and forth with the figure who was presented to us as the main villain. You know, before we give her a beatdown and remove all clout and credibility from her persona for the next uh, 17 plus years. But the moment we get next is where this game and and ultimately the series makes itself more clear. You had your thoughts about Kingdom Hearts, your preconceived notions, some confirmed and some completely shaken. Just when you might have had an idea of what this game is about, one swift motion of this Keyblade changes all of that yet again. In a game world with 13 different levels to explore and tons more out there waiting to be discovered, the universe just got a whole lot bigger. Everything up to this point led you to believe that this was just a doofy Disney game with a message about friendship and all that junk. And then there's a stabbing and it becomes apparent that 
Well, yes, the, the game is still all of that, but it's got something else to tell you, a, a bigger story to tell. And you want nothing more than to know what this crazy game has to say, but in the meantime, you have to fight the goddamn dragon from Sleeping Beauty, Maleficent's last hurrah before she fades into irrelevance. Everything afterwards is just... it's madness. The rate of stabbings in this game takes a quick and steep incline, and once again, I was left sitting there asking, excuse me, I mean, forgive me, but can you do that, Kingdom Hearts? Is this allowed? You want to shake a six-year-old's view of the world? There's no better way to do that than by turning Sora into a goddamn shadow, or as we called it in my household, one of those little ant guys. Sora's sacrifice, while incredibly temporary, is hands down the most memorable moment in the game for me, and it has consequences that reach beyond the confines of this first installment, unbeknownst to me at the time, aka Sora killed himself and had a 14-year-old baby, let's not mince words here. From the Riku Ansem fight onwards, we're just knee-deep in utter chaos up until we reunite with Donald, Goofy, and the now upright Kairi before taking our reprieve back in Traverse Town. I love how the world is split in two, how we have to find another path back to the castle because the final keyhole has been spilling out these unspeakably strong Heartless, making it far too dangerous to go back the normal way. We have the best Kairi moment in the series, which I'm going to count as part of the Hollow Bastion arc. We gear up with Sid one final time, and we make our way back to the world to clean up the unfinished business we left behind. I mentioned the end of the world almost felt like post-game stuff, and I think that vibe really starts when you make your second landing at Rising Falls. Like, we beat Riku Ansem, we save Kairi and the other princesses, but we have a couple of loose ends to tie up. The Heartless here, and everywhere else, are now beefier than ever, though I wish our second climb up to the Castle Chapel was a bit different instead of a retread over our first trip, but it's really the only qualm I have with what's otherwise a perfect world in my book. For me, it's the prettiest world to look at, it's the most fun to play, the most atmospheric, and the most impactful, home to some of the most iconic scenes in the series. For a bastion that's supposedly hollow, it's filled to the brim with the absolute best that KH1 and the series has to offer. Alright, more than 17,000 words and over an hour later, we've finally reached the end of this arbitrary and reductive exercise. I had a lot of fun putting my thoughts to the page for this, and I really hope I did these worlds justice because they're all so influential for how I would come to view, really, video games in general. I'd love to hear how you guys would order these last seven worlds, or all 13 if you want, and tell me why I'm wrong for having these in all the wrong spots. In other news, I crossed over the impossibly lofty 50 subscriber milestone in between these two videos, so I want to thank you guys again for your comments and support. So many of you have been incredibly kind, and it makes these projects worthwhile. I don't think I don't notice when I see the same names show up in the comments, because I do, and I truly appreciate the consistency and the words of encouragement. I'd also love to take any suggestions for what I should cover next, and that can pertain to Kingdom Hearts 1 or any other game in the series, or any other game period, really. Uh, as of right now, I'm a bit limited to PS4 and PC games as a reliable way to capture footage off of other consoles isn't exactly cheap, but I'm not opposed to investing a bit and maybe branching out to other stuff. Uh, but primarily, I'd love to talk about Kingdom Hearts, and especially KH1, as much as possible. Possible. Thanks for sticking with me here, and as a boy involuntarily transformed into a lion once said, We have to say goodbye for a little while. Ansem says, Excuse me, do you have a moment to talk about my nipples? <laughs> Fuck. Come on. <laughs> oh my god, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs>